back to your question, uh, Patrick. Patrick asked, would you, said, uh, I would like to know what brought you to believe in simulation theory versus straight catastrophism. Well, sitting in a prison cell with a scientific calculator, and I am basically compiling Chronicon for the first draft, and I have literally over a thousand handwritten pages of calculations forward and backward in time between all the events in history that I'm pretty, pretty, I'm real certain these are the exact dates for, because I had to eliminate thousands of dates simply because we, they, were, they, were, they were really, they were just uh, best guesses. They weren't based on any real chronographical information. So, <coughs> Simulation theory, before I even knew such a thing as simulation theory was already being addressed, I had already recorded all these anomalies, mathematical anomalies between historical events that just didn't make sense. Uh, one simple one that I can convey right now is, uh, and I can, I'll get into some more complex ones, but one simple one is that in documenting the Phoenix phenomenon, one, I, it just, I was incredulous that no one else in the world was publishing anything about the Phoenix. But if you read the literature from the 3rd, 2nd, 1st B, uh, centuries B.C., which was large, largely Alexandrian literature, and they had compiled in a mass through Alexander the Great all the, all the copies of all the texts from the ancient world. And their chief fear was something uh, called the Phoenix in Greek. You know, it's called Fink and Nof and and Feng in China, and in different, you know, in uh, Penn and Appen and, and Akkadian and Sumer, it's a, it's all the same phenomenon. Every, it, but <clears throat> the mathematical precision, it, it just shocked me. So, I'm reading a text. Uh, it's an Egyptian tran, it's a, it's an English translation of a lot of obscure Egyptian. Uh, references that all involved arithmetic and it was just a compilation that's found on, on the uh, uh, Egyptian monuments and all that and one of them that just really shocked me was a reference to a uh, 1656 uh, lunar period it was 1656 moons and I come across a reference to in the Jewish Haggadah that every 1656 days a, uh, no, excuse me, every 1,000, uh, 1,656 moons, the angel of death visit, visits our world and something happens bad on our world. And as an example, the Haggadah tells the Sodom and Gomorrah story and how the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Adma, Zeboam, Bela, the five cities of the plain were totally obliterated from the sky by the angel of death. And it just shocked me that uh, the Jewish Haggadah would turn around and say, for this period is 138 years. I had already found many very unusual sun-darkening earthquake episodes all being 138 years apart. So, now I give these details in When the Sun Darkens, my very first Phoenix books. I explain exactly what I'm telling you now. Uh, about the 138 years, what was found in the Haggadah, what's found in the Jewish records, what's found in the Egyptian records about the 1656. And it just shocked me because I knew that 1,656 years is exactly what the book of Genesis says was the duration of the pre-flood world before the sun darkened and the flood happened. So I see all these correlates and I begin to build a mathematic timeline. And I don't really have to build it. Now I just go through all my, all my notes I start from the very beginning, as far as I can go, and the, far, the farthest one I found was 4309 BC, and I and I and I start amassing them and I put them into this timeline. I found them; they're all 138 years apart. It's basically the same thing happening somewhere on this Earth is reset. It's mud floods. It's it's some strange vibration from the sky that literally liquefies or seems to liquefy solid objects to where people, livestock, and even whole cities just sink into the ground. And when the noise ends. Everything turns solid again. So I keep finding this over and over. And it's always 138 year intervals and 138 years apart. And what shocks me even more is the precision. We can suspend our disbelief and believe that in a 5,000 year period, an object returns to transit the sun. Transit means it passes directly between us and the sun <coughs> and blocks out the solar light 
to darken some part of the earth. Now, we can suspend our belief, and, and let's just say that that can't happen, that the orbital periodicities can actually go and, and work that way. But in the month of May, every single time, around mid-May, May 14th, 15th, and 16th, that's not possible. That is too precise. There is nothing in, there, there is no comets and bolides. Nothing in our, in, in Newtonian physics can move with such precision. So here's one note I had in answer to you, Patrick, is that the absolute precision of the timing of the Phoenix phenomenon is impossible. And yet we have all the historical data. We have all the chronographical material. We can put it all up. Anybody can follow my research by just chasing my source materials, reading from the bibliographic notations, finding those things in those books, and put together the Phoenix. I'm not needed. can put together the whole Phoenix phenomenon because I didn't date a single thing. So to find this whole 5,000-year timeline that that the next the next point on the, the next data point is May, mid-May of the year 2040. Now, 